Everyone, good morning. It's good to have you with us. Today is Sunday, May 9th, 2021. Good to be together on this day. Today is the day that the Lord has made, so we rejoice and are glad in it. We're going to pick up today where we left off just a couple of weeks ago with one of my favorite scripture passages, and that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. And today we're going to be talking about this idea of vocation. This is one of my favorite passages because I just think there's so much in here. So it's very hard to kind of limit ourselves to just one theme or idea. But today we're going to be on the theme of vocation. When I was a youth pastor for years and years, I led trips down to Mexico, mission trips where I would take groups of uh, students, high school and college students down, and we would work with kids down there with local churches, usually out in rural areas. We would lead uh, vacation Bible schools for the kids. We'd also do some construction projects and other sorts of ministry. It was a wonderful time, but there were always some uh, cross-cultural things that we need to be very aware of. And we were out in the country, and this was a number of years ago, so people tended to be somewhat more uh, conservative. So the students needed to dress in such a way that uh, the way they looked wouldn't get in the way of the work that we were doing. So all of the guys had to wear long pants and all of the girls had to wear dresses. Even if we were out and these were hot, hot days, we're out playing with kids and it might be dusty and dirty and they were active and they'd be sweating, but guys had to wear long pants, girls had to wear dresses. And sometimes there'd be some pushback from the students. They say, why is this so important? Why does God care whether I wear long pants or shorts for the girls? Why, why do I have to wear a dress versus long pants? Why does God care about these things? My response was, I don't think God actually does care about these things. These are cultural issues, but we have to be sensitive to make sure that our attitudes in our words in our behaviors and our appearance doesn't get in the way of our greater purpose and our greater message our mission or our vocation was greater than any of our individual preferences in this situation so this is one of the things that the apostle paul is really getting at here in this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. Hear the word of the Lord. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this passage, I think, raises for us the issue of vocation. What is vocation? And how is vocation different from occupation? Well, simply put, occupation is what you do. What occupies your time for the purpose, usually, of making a living. Vocation carries with it a sense of special purpose or higher calling. The Bible takes this idea of vocation very seriously. From the very beginning, you and I were created to, for a very important vocation, that we were to be image bearers of God 
right there at the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, it says that human beings were created in the image of God. We are image bearers, and to be an image bearer of God means that we are created to embody who God is, God's care, God's justice, God's creativity, and most of all, most important of all, God's love. The grand story of the Bible is how humankind being created in God's image, being given this high calling or vocation, we fell short of it. The story is how sin entered into the world, into our relationships, into our institutions, leading to a world that we have now, a world that is all too often filled with pain, discord, and of course, death. But into this dark and fallen world, God sent his son, Jesus. And as the story tells us, God is in the process of redeeming the world. Jesus was the perfect human being, the human being that none of us was ever able to be. And Jesus shows us God's heart, how we can live in relationship with God. Through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, he overcame sin and death and has reconciled us to God. Because of Jesus, we can now live back into our true vocation, the vocation of being image bearers of God. The stain of sin has been removed. As this passage says, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Isn't that awesome? We are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So we have this new, or rather renewed, calling, renewed vocation to know and to serve God as followers of Jesus. So we're reconciled to God through Jesus. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. We're restored to our place as image bearers with the more specific vocation now of being ambassadors. Ambassadors. What does it mean to be an ambassador for Christ? Well, an ambassador is an official representative. Usually, we hear about an ambassador going from one country or kingdom to another. An ambassador's purpose or mission is to represent their sovereign or leader to another group of people. Now, it's important to note that an ambassador is still a person, an individual. For example, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Argentina currently is a woman named Mary Kay Carlson. Now, she has a family and she has things that she enjoys doing like any other person. She has opinions about things, opinions about people. She has viewpoints about the country in which she is serving. She has all these things that you or I would have if we went to visit Argentina. The difference is she has a mission to represent the United States in Argentina. And everything that she says and does in public must support this mission. When she gets in her car, and I don't know if she drives or she has a driver, but when she's driving around, she is representing the United States. When she goes shopping or to a, to a restaurant, she represents the United States. And everything she does, she is presenting a set of values and policies to the community where she has been sent. In the same way, as followers of Jesus, we now share in his mission. We have been appointed, so to speak, as ambassadors for Christ to represent him in the place where we are now, the place where Jesus has sent us. This is our vocation, the higher calling upon our lives that God has given to us. This vocation supersedes, <clears throat> or better, this vocation includes all of our roles, occupations, and even other vocations that we might have. I think it's helpful to think of the various roles that you have in your life. If I asked you to describe who you are, what, what roles would you come up with? Are you a husband or wife, sister or brother, mother, father, son or daughter? These are family roles, relationship roles that you have. You also are a neighbor or a friend to somebody. Work-wise, you are a boss, an employee, a coworker. 
You could be a leader or a follower in different organizations that you're a part of. All these are different ways of describing yourself. And I'm sure that you can come up with some other roles that describe you besides what I've just mentioned. These are the roles in your life. How can you be an ambassador for Christ in this role? How can you represent Jesus in these different roles that you have? If you are in a role that you really don't enjoy, such as a difficult or tedious job, how does your vocation as an ambassador change the way that you approach your work? And the same question applies to the work that we really enjoy or find very rewarding. How does your vocation as ambassador for Christ change the way that you approach your work? We have a calling that is bigger than ourselves, bigger than our personal preferences, bigger even than our personal responsibilities. And we are first and foremost ambassadors. As a neighbor, I am first and foremost a representative of Jesus Christ before my own personal preferences and even before my own irritations about things that my neighbor might do that really bother me. I'm thinking first and foremost, how can I represent Jesus in this relationship with this person in this place where God has placed me? Now, one of the most important jobs of an ambassador is not only to represent their country or their sovereign, their king or their president, but also to deliver important messages on behalf of their leader. The U.S. ambassador might go to the president of another country and express, for example, the displeasure of our president at the way that country is behaving, in the way that they're bullying their neighbors or in the shady way they've run their elections. These are just examples. These are responsibilities of an ambassador. But the ambassador may have the opportunity to bring a very positive message, such as a change of policy that improves relations between the two countries or makes the other country a most favored trading partner, for example. The ambassador has the privilege and the responsibility of speaking on behalf of their leader and conveying messages of great importance. As ambassadors for Christ, we have been given the privilege of bringing a wonderful and powerful message from our leader, the message of reconciliation, that God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ. What an awesome message to have and to be able to convey to other people. And we, as followers of Jesus, have experienced this firsthand. We know that we are loved by God, that we are forgiven through Jesus, that we are invited into a relationship with God through Jesus. Having experienced this, we now have as part of our vocation the mission of sharing it with others. So again, I invite you to think about the roles that define your life. As you consider your vocation as ambassador for Christ, consider how the message of reconciliation affects each of your roles. How might God open up the opportunity for you to share about God's love and his desire to be reconciled with each of us? How can you share about Christ taking all of our sin upon himself so that we are no longer separated from God? Perhaps there's reconciliation that needs to happen in your own life, in your own relationships. Reconciliation with family members, neighbors, coworkers, even friends, maybe even church members. Maybe this reconciliation needs to happen before we can authentically share God's message of reconciliation with others. Well, God has made each of us, you and I, to be unique people, different interests, different abilities, different personalities, different temperaments. We each also find ourselves to be in our own unique context with different opportunities and different relationships. Life is a challenge, just as it is, simple enough. It's a challenge for each person to make their way through it. But for those of us who have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. And we have a new, a greater sense of calling on our lives. We have a new vocation. A vocation to be ambassadors for Christ, representing Jesus in everything that we do, in all of our roles, in all of our relationships, and bringing with us 
the amazing good news that God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a blessed week.